friends at ISIS got me this um, cultural heritage <laughs> memento to take with me here today. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, we're often reminded of Bismarck's famous dismissal of the Balkans. He said they were not worth the life of a single Pomeranian musketeer, later amended to Grenadier. We also know well of uh, Marx's admonition that historical events appear twice, first as tragedy and then as farce. Well, <laughs> when we put them together for an operation such as Joint Guardian in Kosovo, we get this, which I will actually spare you. Most of you have probably seen this Norwegian uh, parody of the Beach Boys song, Kokomo, done to the words of Kosovo. Very cheesy. We say, oh, you're going to Kosovo. No worries, no worries. Nice little travelogue about the breakaway province from Syria. Okay. Well, closer to home, we, uh, we see news reports, especially from America's most, uh, military's most trusted news source, the Duffel Blog, which reported back in December how the Army realizes it left troops in Kosovo. Uh, so the satirical website mock quotes the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey, being suddenly reminded of the U.S. military's 15-year mission in Kosovo. All of a sudden, this commercial aired on AFN and saying, K-4 is ready and relevant in the 21st century. And I'm like, what the hell? We still have troops there? Well, okay, so given its lack of notoriety, one might well hope this unmemorable mission is quickly forgotten. However, given its low cost in American casualties and treasure, maybe it's actually not such a bad thing if, with apologies to the SAS, George Santayana, we're condemned to repeat this mission elsewhere. Uh, we Americans are, with our notoriously short collective memory, can afford to be lighthearted about Kosovo because essentially we're bystanders there, not antagonists. This is the least dangerous combat tax exclusion zone mission for a, a soldier is likely to face these days. One could drive off post in a soft-bodied SUV without security convoy escort. One can mingle in the cities without great fear. American flags regularly fly next to Albanian ones. In downtown Pristina, one can drive on Bill Clinton Boulevard and past the Bill Clinton statue, waving a welcome to all visitors. It's quite an experience serving in a contingency location where the locals visibly like having Americans around, especially those in uniform. Now this may all sound like the Norwegians were right with their easygoing Kosovo music video, but behind this stable, normal environment lays a hard-bought piece paid for with the NATO munitions being dropped <coughs> in Serbia and Kosovo and with Kosovo-Albanian lives. In 1999, NATO launched its bombing campaign to cur curtail the ruthless ethnic cleansing of Kosovo. This was carried out by Serbian-dominated Yugoslav secur security forces acting purportedly at the behest of the Belgrade autocrat Slobodan Milosevic. While NATO dropped its explosive arsenal over 78 days in and around Serbia and Kosovo, these security forces inside Kosovo intensified their brutal campaign of elimination. The then Yugoslav army and police could not hurt the NATO planes, but they could forcibly relocate Kosovo Albanians by busing, trucking, or train carrying them to the Albanian and Macedonian borders and then dumping them off. Along the way, they raped thousands of women and girls, and for those who could not move, they simply disappeared them. On the bottom, you go around Koso, Kosovo, Ukshin Hoti was a political dissident. He got moved, and nobody ever saw him again. On the top here, this was on the 16th anniversary of the end of the NATO bombing, and what it is representing inside the Pristina Stadium each of these skirts, each of these dresses, row upon row, from end zone to end zone, are women and girls who were raped by Serbian security forces during the time that the Serbians were um, in charge during the Civil War, 1998 to 1999. 
When Belgrade eventually capitulated, her security forces withdrew, while NATO led peace keeping troops advanced. We got a UN resolution saying, bring these troops in because it's a grave humanitarian situation and uh, uh, provide freedom of movement for the safe and free return of all refugees and displaced persons. What K4 did and has continued to do was put a lid on the bold, uh, boiling cauldron of ethnicities while also helping to reduce the heat to the pot. To ensure this, the uh, UN resolution 1244 provided the means to establish um, European police and civilian forces in the country and to train a Kosovo police force. So Kosovo has its own police force, then it has a European force, and then it has K4, the third responders, only third responders, not called out unless they're needed. Now, K4 does go out and train with a Kosovo police as we see in this uh, uh, 2010 exercise. Now, should all go to hell, uh, K4 troops mobilized to restore freedom of movement throughout Kosovo and a safe and secure environment. American troops filled the majority of the ranks in Kosovo's multinational battle group East. It was once a division, now it's a brigade. It's headquartered at Camp Bonsteel in southern Kosovo. Uh, we also have some American troops up at NATO's Camp Marichal de la Tre de Tassigny in north central Kosovo. Now, the French have long departed, but their unpronounceable Gallic camp name persists, and we just dub it CMLT and call it good. And we jovially called ourselves the Maytag Repairmen, the lowliest responders in Kosovo, because we never get the call. I served with an airborne infantry unit. Can you imagine what it's like for an airborne infantry unit to go nine months in a straitjacket, unable to move forward? Uh, uh, their credo is, you know, escalate in zero to three seconds, and then maximum, you know, move out. And instead, the whole mission here is de-escalate. On, uh, on numerous of occasions in the first half of 2015, when faced with significant protests and borderline riots, uh, the Kosovo police consistently and competently held the line. They are a real professional force, and um, they <coughs> operate by this, this uh, concept that uh, they'll only call for help when the last man is falling and he has his dying breath, he'll say, send for backup, please. This is quite heartening for those who've seen Iraqi forces run, <laughs> abandoned vehicles and run in the face of ISIS terrorists. With this background in mind, um, so long as the U.S. Army is still sending troops to Kosovo, it pays for those mobilized soldiers to understand the underlying cultural historical, and religious animosities that govern the tempers of Albanians and Serbians in Kosovo. Granted, it's taken a few rotations to realize this vital need and then to institutionalize it. Well, 19 rotations to be exact. Uh, the recently concluded K4 rotation 19 that I was in built what we call the first cultural awareness senior leader staff ride. Its purpose is the title of this talk understanding and enhancing soldiers' cultural sensitivity amid the bitter multi-ethnic conflict in Kosovo. So we chose several key sites around Kosovo, some that traced their roots back as far as the 1300s, uh, before leaping back to events in the last quarter century. And in March 2015, nearly 50 commanders and command sergeants majors and first sergeants from American and multinational force contingents boarded a bus from Camp Bonsteel for the day-long tour around the country. Each of them had 15, 20 different articles and papers to read in prep. And then the idea was when they got to a, to a site, they, we would have, just like in a regular cultural, just like in a regular military staff ride, we'd have then an expert who would then talk about what was at that given place. The initial stop was here, the Field of Blackfords, known to history as Kosovo Polier, for the 1389 battle there. In the 1950s, the Serbians built about a 50-foot stone obelisk to commemorate the battle. 
The site is poorly maintained, but nevertheless, Serbia counts it as a cultural monument of exceptional importance to themselves. One reason we didn't do an actual staff right here is because other than the fact that the leaders of both sides died either in or following the battle, we know really very little about how it was fought. Anything we have is notional and, uh, and conjecture. What we do know is that ethnic Serbians and Albanians and Hungarians and Bosniaks fought an advancing Ottoman force comprised of Turks and Serbians and Albanians and additional vassals from southeastern Balkan parts. Uh, the Turk side was mostly Muslim, their opposition predominantly Orthodox Christian. The Turks won the battle, but they lost their sultan to an assassin. Sometime during the battle, the Turks captured the uh, Serbian leader, Prince Lazar, and subsequently executed him. His daughter later married the new sultan, thereby providing protection to the conquered Serbian lands, but the loss itself of Kosovo Polje served as a bitter humiliation to the Serbs' identity. Centuries of oral history, epic poetry, lamenting this fate, followed. In the succeeding years, the Serbians, as they evolved into a nationality, kept solace in their Orthodox Christian religion as the key to their identity. The Albanians forcibly converted from Christianity, but in truth only nominally Muslim now, traced their identity to their language. This split, however, gradually exacerbated relations between the two ethnic groups during the 500 years of Ottoman occupation. Albanians and Serbians viciously, viciously fought back and forth in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 and 1914 and throughout the creation of Yugoslavia to the early 1920s. Its modern peak of this animosity occurred 600 years after the battle in 1389. As the anniversary approached, Yugoslavia saw the spectacle of the body of Prince Lazar the Serbian national hero who fell at the battle being pr processed and processed around the country to commemorate this battle. It served as a warm-up to Yugoslav strongman Milosevic's implicit call to arms at the battlefield site before a reported million Serbs. This is now 1989. His speech drew a sharp distinction between the cross and the crescent. He riled up the crowd, noting that in the 1389 battle, Serbians lost their way, but in 1989 they had finally regained it. He added that Serbians had to fight to retain the purity of their identity. Wherever Serb blood is spilt and wherever Serbian bones are buried, this must be Serbian territory. Thus, in a rhetorical flourish, Milosevic had summarily erased Albanians' part on the Serbian side of the battle. He lumped them together with the Turks as Muslim invaders who had illegitimately seized lands rightfully and allegedly historically belonging only to the Serbian people. This was important. The Turks had long since departed, but the Albanians had not. They make up 90% of Kosovo today. This was no historical anomaly. Serbia itself, as a country, had only incorporated Kosovo and its majority Albanian populace into this governance in 1912, when the Balkans people threw off the yoke of Ottoman rule. But the facts did not matter to Milosevic in crafting a 600-year Serbian national claim from history to the land of Kosovo. And notwithstanding the communist autocrat Joseph Broz Tito's granting of Kosovo, uh, separate and equal provincial standing to the rest of Yugoslavia, Milosevic had revoked it and returned it to domination under Greater Serbia, even as the Yugoslav nation itself began to disintegrate. He then instituted a system of ethnic apartheid, banning the teaching of the Albanian language and history in schools, firing Albanian speakers uh, as teachers, and removing Kosovo Albanians from the provincial government. His political purpose for this was to entrench himself in power by manipulating ethnic dreams of greater Serbia and the Serbian Orthodox Christian identity. It mattered not that it came at the expense of the majority of the populace of Kosovo, 
the Albanian-speaking Muslims. For those familiar with Iraq, just think minority Sunnis oppressed by a majority Shiites under Saddam. As Kosovo Albanians blanched at this new second-class status, Milosevic sought to crush the opposition. Political dissidents like the aforementioned Ukshin Hoti found them in self-prison for most of the 1990s. Well, around 1992, despite uh, some Kosovo Albanian officials trying to uh, use a more peaceful approach, those who felt like the time had come to raise up arms formed the Kosovo Liberation Army. An armed insurgency following, uh, that followed increasing re uh, repression and the evident failure of nonviolent resistance to bring about change. In 1998, open conflict broke out between the KLA and the Serbian government forces. One of the KLA's early leaders, Adam Yashari, had planned and conducted isolated hit and run raids and ambushes on Serbian police between 1991 and 1998. Um, hailing from the ethnically Albanian hamlet of Prakaz in central west Kosovo, Yashari lived in his family compound, but at night slept 400 meters away atop a forested slope inside a hard scrabble wooden hut, comforted only by a cheap unadorned foam mattress for a bed. No Serbian security forces proved brave enough to confront him in his mountainside hideout. However, by early 1998, the Serb forces had had enough of being toyed by this resistance, and uh, they took concerted action. Uh, they massed around the Yashari family compound on March 5th, and um, they began lobbing mortar rounds into the Yashari family buildings. The Yashari family, including their fighter, Adam Yashari, uh, armed themselves in defense with only small arms weapons. Security forces demanded his surrender, but he would not leave. They promised his family safe passage from their home, but when a member of another branch of the family stepped out, he was shot in the head. If the KLA had wanted an incident that would unite Kosovo Albanians against the Serbian government, what follows undoubtedly provided the means. In what became known as the Yashari Family Massacre, Serbian security forces advanced and killed every living member inside the compound. More than 50 Yasharis died in the onslaught, including women and young children, some as young as the age of seven. Adam Yashari perished as well. News reports later described Serbian desecration of the bodies. Today, the Yashari family compound is kept just as it appeared on the third and final day of the onslaught, March 7th, 1998. There's protective scaffolding that allows visitors to walk outside the various levels to see the destruction. There is an Albanian folkloric saying that a family needs three sons. One to take care of the parents, one to immigrate to a safe land, and one to fight for his people. The Yashari who stayed with his parents died with them that day. The Yashari who joined the fight for his people died that day with his wife and children. The Yashari who emigrated to Germany, refought, lived. His son returned to Prakaz, where his children have repopulated the dissipated numbers of the Yashari family. When we bring K-4 troops out, we walk the grounds. And so we see the building, and we can walk up and see all the military guys who have uh, field artillery and other, and other uh, expertise can say, oh, that was a 155 round, that was a such and such, and then you, you can see all that around here. Here is the line. There's 17 over three rows, all Yashari family members that you see here. They have a member of their security force, the Kosovo force here. This was the anniversary of the battle, and so at Adam's grave, uh, a number of um, uh, flowers and other things were left out. And this is a statue in downtown Skendera of Adam Yashari, who they call the legendary commander. When you see something like this, uh, stuff around Kosovo starts to make sense. Because when you arrive, you go into the Adam Yashari airport. The stadiums are named for Adam Yashari. The sports arenas are named for Adam Yashari. Countless roads and memorial markers have etched images of KLA fighters lost in the war to counter-Serbian 
aggression in Kosovo. Alas, uh, the war's wounds have left long scars on the people in Kosovo. Uh, on the way out, after seven day, 78 days of bombing, they capitulated and said, all right, we'll, we'll withdraw. And they knew that NATO forces would be coming in to, to uh, succeed them. Uh, the armed forces and paramilitary forces damaged or destroyed 207 of the approximately 609 mosques in Kosovo. Uh, as well as more than 500 kulas, which are traditional stone mansions often associated with prominent Albanian families. They destroyed historic bazaars. Some destruction was clearly spiteful. For instance, fleeing Serbian police destroyed the central historical archive of the Islamic community of Kosovo. <coughs> its records stretched back for 500 years. It was burned to the ground with the loss of all records. Also, on the way out, Serbians relocated. We're just relocating this stuff for its own protection. I reported 1,200 cultural and historic artifacts, including the goddess on the throne, a Neolithic figure purportedly 6,000 years old. Uh, in violation of the rules of law, they hold themselves up in churches and so forth. Um, a lot of ugly things go on there. They finally grabbed Milosevic, they sent him to the Hague for war crimes trials. However, this is not the end of the story. Um, Albanians are now in charge. Serbians who are uh, in charge of the crimes have left. So what about the Serbians who've left, uh, who have actually are from Kosovo and haven't, uh, haven't departed because this is their homes? Well, they stay, but they live in these um, uh, guarded enclaves. There's a film out there this year called Enclava about the, pri the plight that they have because they can stay only where they, the Serb speakers are. If they leave out, um, they may have trouble. Some call this a soft ethnic cleansing by the Albanians. This is a, a note of a bridge that goes from southern Mitrovica, which is Albanian speakers, to northern Mitrovica, which is Serbian. And so you have this strack soldier here on the Albanian side where you can actually drive across. But when you get halfway across, they've put in dirt, they've put in sod, they've put in flowers. If you get past there, you see that they've actually torn up the pavement so that you can't drive any further. When you get to that other side, they have this obelisk here of Serbians who were killed in retaliation after NATO arrived. On the Albanian side, there's a statue of Isa Bolatini. He was a freedom fighter for Albanians back in the early 1910s against Serbians. They just brought his body back and decided they were going to bury it in his hometown of Bolatin, which, ironically enough, is now inside um, Serbian, uh, Kosovo Serbian controlled territory. So they're, they're, they have to have come to some agreement, some accommodation there. Um, which is not really uh, likely to come. After the NATO troops arrived, uh, Albanians returning, looking for retaliation, um, committed some massacres of their own. And they, uh, uh, this is a lady outside the Grazanica Monastery who notes that, um, you know, where are our people? Uh, farmers went out and they were disappeared by Albanians. Over here in the Grazanica Monastery, you see signs like this giant word missing, and then on it are individual pictures. In this case, Serbians, who Albanians coming back have made go away. And then you have the Grazanica Monastery and Church. This was built in 1321. Okay, so we think all is well, except in 2004, a rumor came out that some Serbians had chased a 12-year-old girl with dogs, and she had run to the river to escape, and then didn't swim and drowned. And so Albanian Kosovars went around the country and destroyed some more, mo uh, some more churches. Um, when the Serbs left, they destroyed mosques. Now the Albanians were destroying churches. And they did come up to try to do something really bad to this. But the K-4 commander came out and said, whoa, 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 I got some troops. 
And rather than falling back on being the Maytag repairman, he actually sent troops out to the Gratzenitsch Monastery. Um, this is the ironic thing, is that the Albanians, because we, we helped them to get free, love us. And now the Serbians love us. Kind of the way the Sunnis did in the late days, because they know we can protect them from the majority who may not want to see them living much longer. These are some of the masterpieces, the frescoes that they have inside uh, the Church of the Holy Virgin. And then they tell us, you soldiers, you're welcome. Anytime you want to come here, you don't need an invitation. Please come by and we'll show you uh, around and give you a tour and so forth. Um, you'll see here that there's uh, graffiti on uh, religious sites. It makes us as historians sick to see this. Um, and we try to tell them, look, Kosovo's heritage is the world's heritage. Some are Serbian, some are Albanian, but it belongs to all of us. And so we hope with this newborn sign that, yes, if ethnic heritage, uh, hatreds don't strangle this baby in the crib, they all may be able to, to get along. And the presence that we have and the ability that we have to understand these animosities and to actually go out to these sites um, helps us in our interactions with folks, helps us understand what's going on, and uh, helps to impart some knowledge to folks that um, they shouldn't be destroying historical mm -hmm. artifacts and things. Uh, <coughs> we belong to everyone. Other than that, I thank you. <laughs>